Okay, quick introduction here. I just want to say welcome to the inaugural talks for the Cardiovascular Scientist Seminar Series. Um, as many of you know, we have three goals for this series. The first is to promote our faculty and the great work that we do at the University of Guelph, to increase our networking and collaboration and strengthen our graduate programs, and to attract the best and brightest undergraduates to research in cardiology or health sciences. Okay, uh, there's a few quick notes before the introduction and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, two members of the Student Executive Council because they were very instrumental in organizing everything today. I totally forgot to use that. <laughs> there's your notes. Okay. Okay, so just a couple of notes before we start. So first off, I'd like to um, say a special thanks to the Center's Student Executive Council, and they were a big help in organizing today's talk, as well as organizing the whole initiative of starting up this seminar series. Um, two, uh, we just would like to ask that everyone remain for both speakers. We have two speakers today. Um, and three, we're gonna hold questions until the end. Um, so you're welcome to come down at the end and ask any questions. Um, and we can cover both talks at that time and you can talk to either of our speakers. And number four, I'd just like to thank um, the Ontario Veterinary College, CBS, and Biomed for supporting today's pizza lunch. So I'm just gonna send it to Priya. Okay, so now uh, I have the honor of calling on Dr. Jeff Wichel, the Dean of OVC, uh, to say a few words to introduce our speakers for today. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very, a very great pleasure for me to introduce our speakers today and to welcome you to the Ontario Veterinary College. Fantastic showing for the inaugural event in this uh, seminar series, but not surprising now that I've got to know the individuals involved in the center. They're uh, very focused, passionate people, and uh, I think this is going to be a great success. Uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, and uh, first speaker is uh, Dr. Philip Miller. To my right here, uh, Dr. Miller is an assistant professor in the Department of Human Health and Nutritional Sciences at the University of Guelph. He's an affiliated scientist at the Toronto General Research Institute. Uh, he received his MSc and PhD degrees from the Department of Kinesiology at McMaster University and completed a four-year postdoctoral fellowship in clinical cardiovascular physiology at the University Health Network and Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. Dr. Miller's laboratory studies integrate human physiology with a focus on sympathetic control of circulation. He has published over 40 peer-reviewed papers and his work is supported by NSERC, CFI, Government of Ontario, and CIHR. So welcome, Dr. Miller. Okay, thank you very much. So I thought I was the opening act for Dr. Soleil, but I think the pizza is the opening act for myself. Um, I'm going to try not to cough for 30 minutes straight, uh, but I can't make any promises on that. So to start off, I don't have any disclosures for this talk at all. If anyone would like to offer some, I, I may be interested. So I'm going to have four main points that I'd like to talk about today, and that is a brief overview of sympathetic control as it pertains to cardiovascular regulation. I'm going to talk about how we measure the sympathetic nervous system in humans, and then I'm going to talk about two lines of research uh, that my lab and myself have been involved in. And these involve microneurographic recording studies looking at the organization and regulation of the sympathetic nervous system, as well as an applied a phase looking at targeting sympathetic activity and how that may be modulated. So this figure is not uncommon for most, I think everyone here, and which shows the chain of the autonomic nervous system, uh, the two divisions looking at the outflows relative to circulatory control. And so in this figure here it's showing autonomic outflow from the brainstem regions involving the parasympathetic nervous system innervating the heart and affecting heart rate and to a much lesser extent contractility and then the sympathetic nervous system innervation directed towards the heart, uh, the adrenal gland, the kidneys as well as vascular smooth muscle. I think one of the misconceptions that we want to recognize in this figure and all other figures that are published in most textbooks is that this does not represent a straight line. This straight line makes us believe that when we turn on the sympathetic nervous system, 
that it's directed equally to all tar targets. And we know that that's not true. That we can have increases or decreases specifically towards the heart, the kidneys, or the peripheral vasculature, and they can be regulated on their own. So that's the idea of organ-specific outflow. Now how do we regulate the sympathetic nervous system? And we'll expand on this figure. So the right-hand side of this figure is exactly the same. This is the efferent response of the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. And now we've incorporated the afferent response. So we know that this neural drive is the product of afferent feedback from receptors throughout the body in combination with higher order central brain mechanisms. So it's a combination of the feedback our body receives as well as a feed forward mechanism from higher brainstem regions uh, that integrate to produce these responses. And so why do we care? Why is the sympathetic nervous system important? And I'll start by looking at one figure. And what this figure is showing us is a blood pressure tracing over one minute. On the top and on the bottom of this figure, it's showing a direct recording of sympathetic outflow. So each of these spikes represent a group of action potentials traveling down sympathetic nerves that would release or cause the release of norepinephrine at the synaptic terminal. And what I'd like you to appreciate is that we have these fluctuations in blood pressure over time. And that if you look at those fluctuations, that we see that the sympathetic activation is aligned with the descending phase. And so what this really tells us, what this is indicative of, is the requirement or need of the sympathetic nervous system to help maintain blood pressure, maintain perfusion pressure, so we maintain blood flow to the brain and our other critical organs. So as pressure begins to drop, we unload the mechanoreceptors in our uh, aortic arch and carotid bodies and that activates the sympathetic nervous system to correct that response. So we see these flurries of activities and what follows them is a general rise in pressure. And so we're getting these fluctuations or cyclical variations over time. I'm going to show you another figure that looks very similar. And so this is the same individual who's now undergoing an orthostatic stress. They're put into a chamber from their waist down and applied a negative pressure in that chamber. So it's gonna draw blood away from their heart and towards their legs. And we can see right off the bat that their mean pressure is significantly reduced. The activity level of the overall signal is increased because again, the arterial barrel reflex is trying to combat that change, but again that these fluctuations are occurring synonymous with these bursts of activity. So the sympathetic nervous system has a really integral role in maintaining blood pressure, especially in acute settings. Like when we all stand up, we know that the sympathetic nervous system turns on to prevent blood from pooling and to prevent uh, blood pressure from dropping. There's another aspect that we think is important, and that is the observation that we see chronic overactivation of the sympathetic nervous system in almost every cardiovascular, respiratory, and most metabolic diseases. So if you look at this list, this list represents you know, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 percent of all mortality within Canada. And we can see in each of these that the sympathetic nervous system is increased. And if you look at clinical data that breaks this down even further, and this is really the first study that did that, this was a study in heart failure patients that was looking at measuring plasma norepinephrine, so norepinephrine being the primary neurotransmitter of the sympathetic nervous system, and looking at the probability of survival. And those that had the greatest the highest plasma norepinephrine had the poorest survival rating. And we've seen this across other diseases now as well. So those that have the greatest overactivation of the sympathetic nervous system, whether this is secondary to the disease or causal is still unclear, 
but they seem to have the greatest uh, risk of death. So there's a clinical aspect as well as a physiological aspect. So how do we measure sympathetic activity in humans? And I'm going to talk really about three primary methods in a, in a very brief overview. The way that most of us are familiar with is with plasma norepinephrine measurements. We take a blood test, we do a blood draw, we measure the concentration of that sympathetic neurotransmitter. And the problem with this measure, especially from a research side, is that it's limited in its respect because it doesn't tell us where that norepinephrine is coming from. So it's a systemic measure. It can't tell us that it's coming from the heart or the kidneys or skeletal muscle. The other aspect is that it can't tell us anything about the rate of clearance of norepinephrine. So the presence of norepinephrine in the blood is dependent not only on the activity of those sympathetic fibers, but also the reuptake by the norepinephrine transporter. And a number of conditions, including heart failure, they have issues with clearance of norepinephrine that can lead to increases in plasma concentrations. So there's a role, but I'd say it's more of a general systemic marker. It's not very specific at targeting where increased sympathetic activity is occurring. The other measures, and cardiac, we can do renal, we can do whole body, involves providing radio-labeled norepinephrine and measuring venous and arterial samples to get an accurate estimate of uh, uptake as well as spillover. And the problem with this method is that it requires catheterization, it's invasive, it's expensive, and very limited cent centers have the capability to do this. The third technique that I'd like to talk and I'll talk more about today involves microneurography. And this is the direct insertion of a tungsten microelectrode into a peripheral nerve. And what we know is that we can distinguish between two types of postganglionic sympathetic fibers. We can distinguish between fibers that are directed towards skeletal muscle, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, muscle sympathetic nerve activity, or sympathetic fibers directed towards blood vessels in the cutaneous vasculature. And so we think of this as being more pressure and flow regulatory, and this being more thermo uh, temperature control. This is an example of what this looks like. And so this is a representative figure. This is an image from our lab in which we have two micro tungsten microelectrodes. We have a ground placed underneath the surface of the skin and we have an active electrode in which we percutaneously insert directly into the fibular nerve. And so the easiest way to describe this to people is acupuncture. It's very similar to the procedure of acu acupuncture. The microelectrodes are actually thinner or finer than an acupuncture needle, but it elicits very much the same sensations. You know, like hitting your funny bone, you can feel tingling or numbness, pressure, temperature, and it all can radiate down, down your limb. When we stop moving that electrode, when we've found the, the recording site we would like to collect from, you actually don't feel anything at all. All sensations subside. So it's really only in uh, positioning the electrode that we will actually see uh, any sort of, or feel any sort of sensations. And so this is a, a video that I'm gonna show you <coughs> from some data that we've collected. And so in the last year and a half, I think we just eclipsed 400 microneurography studies in our, in our lab. And this is showing you a single lead ECG trace, a continuous blood pressure trace. This is the raw nerve signal that's being collected. So these represent the action potentials that are traveling down those nerves. And this signal right here is typically what we quantify. And this is an integration. And what that means is we average all the action potentials that occur over a very short period of time so that they create these nice little bursts. And we can count them, and we can look at the area of those bursts, and that's primarily what we're quantifying. And that's what was shown in that image at the beginning relative to the blood pressure fluctuations. So I'm just gonna turn this video on and, 
Make sure there's some volume here. And I want you just to listen because we actually go based on sound when we're differentiating muscle versus uh, skin sympathetic outflow. Oh, now somehow we're inverted. <laughs> of course. And you can't hear any sound. So. <laughs> <laughs> Worked perfectly fine in, in, in the lab. But what you can see this tracing is showing you is as it scrolls across, uh, picture now these now going in the opposite direction, but each of these uh, bursts is associated with these groups of action potentials. And what you'd notice is that these bursts are very well defined. So they have very sharp upstrokes and very sharp downstrokes. They're not wide, they only occur within one cardiac cycle, and that's because these are regulated by the arterial baroreflex. The triggering of a burst is dependent, it always occurs at the exact same time in the cardiac cycle. We know that, and it's based on the trough or the drop in blood pressure that occurs over time within the cardiac cycle. And so there's a very precise on and off, and it almost sounds like waves crashing on the on the shore is how we sometimes describe it and that's how we can differentiate muscle from skin because skin has no regulator. It can be very wide, it can go across multiple cardiac cycles and it sounds very chaotic. And I, I guess you'll have to take my word for that. So I know that's a very brief overview but I want to talk about how we can use that to understand the sympathetic nervous system. And one of the key research questions that uh, I've developed is this idea that within a nerve, do all muscle sympathetic fibers respond concordantly to the same stimulus? And so these are some images from the fibular nerve. And you can see the staining blue here represents individual fascicles within the nerve. And then within these fascicles, the brown stained uh, images here are the sympathetic fibers. The arrows are pointing to fascicles that actually don't contain any sympathetic fibers at all. So our subjects in the lab often are a little, uh, a little mislaid when we find the nerve, but we still have to make an adjustment to try to locate these sympathetic fibers. Within the common fibular or common perineal or fibular nerve, it's estimated there's about 7,500 sympathetic nerves, fibers. So within those, some are going to muscle, some are going to skin. What we wanted to know is do they all respond in the same direction? And really this came from some evidence in animal studies. So in rats, what they did in this individual study was test a whole bunch of different afferent stimuli. They tested against the arterial baroreflex by raising and lowering pressure, the central and peripheral chemoreceptors, and peripheral thermal stimulation. And they actually found that there were subgroups of sympathetic fibers that would only respond to one stimuli. Lots of them responded to both or all of them, but some responded only individually to one. And so it made us think about the technique that we're using. So again, we're using microneurography. We have this electrode placed into a, a nerve fascicle we're recording from fibers that surround that tip of that electrode. And this is again, this example of the raw action potentials. And then we're looking at counting these bursts. But this is an average representation. And so it made us start to question what was actually happening within this signal. And for a conceptualization, we can see uh, a diagram like this. That we're measuring this yellow arrow here. But this yellow arrow could be the summation of two different populations that respond or just one population that responds. So we really didn't have an idea. We didn't have a way to look at that. So what we did was we started to work to develop a technique that allowed us to look at individual sympathetic fibers. And so instead of looking at this multi-unit tracing, we now went back to the raw neurogram, these action potentials, and started to use specialized software to break them out and classify them based on their amplitude and their shape so we could track 
an individual fiber over time to see how it responded. And we did a study where we looked at stimulating the cardiopulmonary bar pulmonary baroreflex. So stretch sensitive mechanoreceptors within the heart and pulmonary circulation. And I'll tell you why we did that in, in the next slide. But really a very simple design. All we did was study people at rest and we give them two stresses. We give them lower body negative pressure or lower body positive pressure. We're either going to take a little bit of blood away from their heart or we're going to push a little bit of blood towards their heart. So we're either unloading or loading those mechanoreceptors. At the same time, we measured these multi and single unit sympathetic recordings. We got estimates of central venous pressure, heart rate, blood pressure, and stroke volume. The reason that we did this very low level of pressure, and so minus 10 millimeters of mercury of negative pressure is akin to just standing up. So it's like testing people in the supine position and just making them stand up. We can't do that with our methods, so we have to simulate that. The reason that we wanted to test the heart is because we already know that the heart contains two populations of afferents that have totally opposite responses. Most of the people are, are less familiar with this idea that we have a cardiac vagal myelinated afferents at venoatrial junctions that when stretched elicit positive feedback responses. So they increase sympathetic activity. At the same time, we also have cardiac unmyelinated afferents. And these are more densely found within the heart, primarily within the left ventricle. And when these are stimulated by the same stretch, they elicit very powerful negative feedback reflexes. So we thought this may be an idea that we are stimulating two groups or populations of receptors and therefore we could see different responses. And that's exactly what we saw here. So this is a recording during negative pressure. This is that raw neurogram. This is the multi-unit tracing. This is showing you that CVP or central venous pressure dropped. And what we found was that 76% of all these single fibers we could identify responded in a negative feedback fashion, but 24% actually went in the opposite direction. We did positive pressure and we got the exact same thing. So it looked like there was two groups of fibers that were going in opposite directions. And we were pretty excited about this. We said, you know, this could be evidence for a sympathoexcitatory cardiopulmonary skeletal muscle reflex. In the minimum, it's the first demonstration of differential sympathetic control in humans. We wanted to extend that and see what the clinical relevance or if this differed in a clinical population that is known to have a higher cardiac preload and atrial pressure. So we studied this in patients that had heart failure and we repeated that exact same study design. And what we found in this study, and this is simply a figure representing the proportion of fibers and it's showing you that 27, per, 27 fibers representing about 82 percent responded in a negative feedback fashion whereas about 18 percent did a positive feedback fashion in controls in heart failure patients it looked very similar but when we loaded the heart with positive pressure when we stretched those receptors in the heart the heart failure patients actually had a complete reversal. That most of their single units responded paradoxically. So that led us to kind of propose this conceptualization that in normal individuals, it's really these unmyelinated afferents that dictate the multi-unit response. But in heart failure, associated with higher atrial pressure, the stretch of these atrial receptors is likely to increase its contribution leading to these overall paradoxical responses. And so some of the future directions that we're looking at now in this is to determine whether this differential control. So what that means is the capacity for the same stimulus to both increase and decrease firing of individual fibers is actually linked to specific afferents. So when we stretch or stimulate an afferent pool, is that linked to a group of efferent fibers? Or is it 
just a way that your brain controls outflow. The third is that, second is that we've only ever done this in older adults or diseased patients. We want to extend this to healthy young individuals. Is this a normal reflex? Is it that the body is better at regulating when it's turning two dials or has one large dial? That's kind of the analogy we like to use. So this is where we're starting to look at now. And then finally, I'd like to talk about an applied intervention. So this is probably the ones that people can generally understand the easiest and the students will think is the, probably the coolest. And that is, we wanted to ask the question, can acute dietary nitrate supplementation with beetroot juice decrease sympathetic activity? And I'll explain our logic behind this thinking. So beets are very high in dietary nitrate. It's now commercialized into really nice small doses that we can take for human consumption. And so our hypothesis came from this idea that a number of studies now have shown the clinical hypotensive benefit of dietary nitrate supplementation. So acutely, you take a dose, and over time, in a period of two to three hours, you can see reductions in blood pressure. And this is attributed to the fact that in the last 10 or 15 years, we began to appreciate that nitrite, and I guess nitrate, can be reconstituted or converted back to nitric oxide. So typically we think of nitric oxide synthesis through the L-arginine pathway, and sometimes we even measure nitrite or nitrate as byproducts. Now it's beginning to become appreciated that nitrite actually acts as a reservoir for nitric oxide synthase and that we can form nitric oxide. And one of the roles of nitric oxide is as a very potent vasodilator. And so these responses here have been solely attributed to the fact that we increase nitric oxide and we cause peripheral vasodilation. And we see that. There's some evidence of that that's been shown. But what we know is that nitric oxide is also involved in central sympathetic regulation. So this is a study where they actually blocked the formation of nitric oxide using L-name, which blocks uh, nitric oxide, oxide synthase. And they saw that over time, in an acute setting, sympathetic activity increased. And they compared that to a time control and a phenylephrine control. And that was to match for the blood pressure responses. So the idea that nitric oxide is sympatho inhibitory. So we thought maybe this could be playing a role if it, in, the, in these blood pressure responses. And so what we did was a double blind, randomized, placebo controlled crossover study, that's a mouthful, in 14 healthy individuals. And we gave them a, a high dose of high nitrate beetroot juice or a placebo nitrate plus depleted beetroot juice. And this is manufactured specifically uh, for scientific purposes. It comes in the identical bottle. It has the identical taste. It's just minus the nitrate. And what we found was that in a period of three hours, these are looking at the placebo. This is the change from baseline to three hours versus beetroot juice, the active, the high nitrate dose. We were able to have small differences in blood pressure and differences in sympathetic activity as well. So this is muscle sympathetic nerve activity, just uh, quantified in two different methods. And what we were able to show is reductions in resting blood pressure coincident with reductions in sympathetic outflow. So why do we think this is important? Well, beetroot juice is very prevalent in the literature. It's been shown to improve exercise performance, endothelial function, arterial stiffness, as well as blood pressure. But always it's attributed to that peripheral vasodilatory mechanism. Each of these factors is also improved by reducing sympathetic outflow. So we think that there's an important neural contribution. And why it's, it's really important is because we actually have very limited therapies that reduce central sympathetic outflow. Most of the drugs we have target peripheral sympathetic actions. 
but that doesn't prevent norepinephrine from being released and from circulating, and that has consequences on itself. And so now we want to use this pilot data to now look at more clinically relevant uh, populations. So I want to mention just four kind of concluding remarks. Uh, we know that the sympathetic nervous system is critical for blood pressure regulation, as well that it's exaggerated in many cardiovascular, respiratory, and metabolic disease states. Uh, microneurography really represents the only method to assess central sympathetic outflow. And that is the action potentials coming from the brain. When we're talking about measuring norepinephrine, that's really neurotransmitter release. And that has to do with how that signal is actually transducted. So this really gives us an idea of how the brain is responding to those afferent and central stimuli. We've demonstrated in older and diseased humans the capacity for the same stimuli to both increase and decrease firing on sympathetic fibers. And now we want to extend that to see if that exists in young, healthy humans. So is it a normal reflex? Is this how we control uh, sympathetic outflow? And then we saw that interventions, or in this case beetroot juice, to increase nitric oxide bioavailability has the capacity to decrease central sympathetic outflow. So this has a potential as a therapeutic target uh, to enact central changes that reduce circulating norepinephrine concentrations. <coughs> and finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my lab, uh, very testosterone heavy, and <laughs> as well as some collaborators and funding uh, providers as well. Thank you.